Hey everybody, it's Scott Shetler here at Extreme Performance Training Systems in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to this week's episode of Strength and Health TV. This week I want to talk about why I'm not a big fan of training programs. When I'm talking about training programs, I'm talking about the pre-developed programs that people will follow for uh, their training. I'm not necessarily talking about programming in general. I think programming is very important, and I also think programming should be very individualized. When you're following a program that, say, an author or somebody who writes you know, on these different blogs or for different magazines and stuff like that, when you get that monthly magazine and you see that program that's written up, that's what I'm talking about. When you're considering these programs, the one thing that they lack is the individualization. You know, now I said I'm a big fan, not a big fan of programs, but I am a fan of programming. And when I think about programming, I'm really thinking about learning how to train yourself. And this is really important. This is actually something that Louis Simmons reiterated to me when I visited Westside Barbell recently, was that, you know, he said that when he gets a new lifter there, that usually it takes about 10 months and they can train themselves. And I think this should be the goal of any programming. When you're talking about development of strength, power, speed, endurance, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to develop through your training, everything really needs to be individualized. My strengths and weaknesses are different than your strengths and weaknesses, so if we follow the same program, we're probably not going to get the same results. Now, early on, when somebody's just starting their training, you know, maybe following a program is not a bad idea. You know, they, they might lack a little bit of direction. They might need a little bit of assistance with how to get in and start, you know, developing their exercise regimen and things like that. So early on, it may be a good idea to start with a preset program, especially one that covers all the bases and gets you training all the, the lifts and all the muscle groups and exposes you to uh, those, those movements. But as you, the, the further you get along in your training age, the more you're going to have to start to customize and individualize the program based on where it is that you're weak, where it is you're strong and such. So it becomes really important for you to get in tune with, your, uh, with the way that you're responding to your programming and what you need to develop to get better based on your goals. You know, whether you're training for sport, whether you're training for strength and power, whether you're training for fitness, you need to be very clear with what it is that you're training for and that will dictate the course that your programming takes. And now to simplify things, you know, if you just consider that there's only three, well really four methods of training to develop muscular tension, it becomes really easy to start developing your program if you understand these basics. So if you read Science and Practice of Strength Training by Vladimir Zatsyorsky, he talks about the methods of strength training being the maximal effort method, the dynamic effort method, and the repeated effort method. And under that repeated effort method, there's also what he calls the submaximal effort method. If you're familiar with the West Side method of programming, Louis Simmons has talked extensively about the max effort method, the dynamic effort method, and the repeated effort method. But just to give you a little bit idea, maxim the maximal effort method is handling maximal weights. And this is usually for one repetition. So this is very, very high intensity. It's also very low volume. You can't handle a huge amount of volume when, we, when you're exceeding 90% of your one repetition max. Now when I talk about intensity, I'm referring to a percentage of your one rep max, not uh, you know, turning a, your ball cap backwards and you know, screaming and grunting while you're lifting weights. So when we talk about intensity, we're referring to a percentage of your one repetition max. Now the dynamic effort method is using a submaximal weight, but you're moving it with the goal of maximal speed or maximal rate of force uh, development. So when you do the dynamic effort method, you're going to work with a, a much lower percentage than you're going to work at the maximal effort method, but you're going to focus on moving it like it is a maximal weight. So you're looking at max speed, max acceleration when you're, when you're lifting the submaximal weight. The repeated effort method, uh, and under the dynamic effort method, that also covers things like jumping and throwing as well. So there's different. Uh, I, I really like the way that Louis talks about these methods in uh, you know velocities. You know, you're training uh, absolute power, you're training explosive strength, you're training speed strength, or you're training strength speed. You know, these are all different velocities of training, and some of those fall under the dynamic effort method. With the repeated effort method, you're talking about taking a submaximal weight and doing repetitions until failure and it's the last few reps when you're approaching failure and you actually fail that that help you achieve the results that you're looking for typically with the repeated effort method the goal is hypertrophy so you're typically going to do uh, single joint exercise and you're gonna you're gonna totally exhaust that muscle 
Now under the repeated effort method, you've also got the submaximal effort method. The only difference between the submaximal effort method and the repeated effort method is that in the submaximal effort method, you're not going to failure. All right, so you're going to do an you're going to do a submaximal weight, but you're going to do an intermediate number of repetitions. So an example of that might be if your one rep max in the squat is 500. You know, maybe you're going to do. Um, 75 to 85 percent of that for uh, five sets of five or something like that. You're not going to go to failure, but you're still going to get uh, a little bit of work, you know, out of that uh, out of that that repetition range. It's going to help you do a little bit higher volume as well. So when you understand that these are the only methods of developing muscular tension, and you can look at all the programs that are out there, you'll see, you know what methods those programs are emphasizing. But I think it's really important, especially when you're talking about the development of high level strength and power or high level athletics, that you utilize all of those methods in your training program. And this is why I'm such a big fan of, of the conjugate method is because we don't, in, when you're using that method, you're not working in blocks. You're working on a weekly microcycle where you're you're utilizing the maximal, the dynamic, and the repeat and submaximal effort methods on a weekly uh, basis. So there is no real cycling, and this allows you to maintain a high level of readiness year round, which is uh, crucial for a lot of the sports, especially the sports that I train that don't really have an off season. You know, when you're looking at things like. Uh, tennis, you're looking at things like swimming, track and field, uh, you don't really have an off-season, you just have to pick and choose the events that you really want to uh, emphasize higher level of performance or you're trying to break records in, and uh, then you, you, you know, make those the target of your annual training cycle. So using the conjugate method allows you to be at 90% or above for your entire training, uh, your entire training cycle, your entire training block, or, or whatever you want to call it. So when you understand that these methods are the only way to develop maximal or to develop muscular tension and that's what's being utilized in all the programs that are out there and being written, then it really helps you when it comes to developing your own training uh, programming because then you just have to understand the other variables of developing a training plan, things like controlling your volume, uh, you know, the relationship of sets and reps, the relationships of intensities to sets and reps and volume uh, and things like that. So once you get a handle on those parameters, it's very easy to, uh, to build your own training program. And basically what you have to understand is the higher intensity you work at, the lower volume. And the lower intensity you work at, the higher volume. So if you're working at, say, between 75 and 85 percent, you're going to be able to do a lot more volume than if you're working at 90, 95 percent or, or higher. So once you understand how to control your volume, it becomes very easy to train after that. And, you know, the best thing to do is to not reinvent the wheel. If you look at uh, the work that Louis Simmons has done, which I, I keep going back to because I think what he's developed is the most versatile method of programming there is because it's got the parameters when it comes to controlling your volume, but it also has all the room for you to customize the training to your strengths and weaknesses in your sport. I think it's just a brilliant approach to training. So once you understand all those variables, you can begin to customize the training based on what it is that you need. So if we use an example, I'll use one of my lifters as an example, a female power lifter who had a max bench at around 180 pounds. And every time she tried to get up to 200 pounds, she would just get stapled to the bench. Now, a lot of programs would tell you if you want to get better at benching, you just need to bench more. You know, the old saying is if you want to bench more, you just need to bench more, you know, meaning you need to bench more often. A lot of these uh, powerlifting programs that just emphasize what you would consider the classical lifts, the bench, the squat, and the deadlift. Uh, you just do more and more volume at lower percentages of that weight. And maybe some people have had some success, some success there. But what really helped her was to develop the smaller muscle groups that were not contributing to the bench and thus holding her bench press back. And it was actually Louis Simmons who identified that for us. He took one look at her, said that she had no front delts, and he suggested that we do a lot of push-ups in the program. So we came back to Atlanta, started plugging in a lot of push-ups after our primary movements, and then she started doing a lot of front delt work, a lot of plate raises uh, to the front and overhead, a lot of front dumbbell raises, laying on an incline bench and doing front dumbbell raises, just all these different variations, some dumbbell presses, all these variations that targeted more the anterior deltoid, the front delts. 
coupled with doing lots and lots of reps in the push-ups, and six weeks later, she made 200 at competition. So she didn't do that by bench pressing more. She did that by going and working the smaller muscle groups that were holding her bench back. And it's really important that you evaluate your training, that you, you video your lifts, you have somebody look at your lifts, and you can go back and look at where you're breaking down and know what muscles are weak, and then you can prioritize those muscles in your training. So this is where I have an issue with a lot of people who say, well, everything's weak, so just train everything. You have to look at you know, your, your, your training program and what you're going to be able to prioritize because you can't train everything with the same uh, intensity or the same, the same volume and f have it all get better because as you go through the training program, you're going to experience fatigue. So the, the exercises that you work at the beginning of the program when you're the freshest, those are the ones that you should prioritize. So I would make those your weakest, uh, those your weakest muscle groups. So if it's the, like my lifter's case, if it's the front delts that are holding you back, then after you do your main bench work for the day, you go right to front delts and you hit those really, really hard so that you can do a lot of work on them when they're fresh. And then you move on to the next weakest group, then the next weakest, and so on down the line until, you're, uh, until you've completed the workout. And those are going to be rotating because once you bring those front delts up to speed and, and uh, you know, you, you've taken care of that problem, then another muscle group is going to need to be emphasized so you need to know where you're breaking down. Maybe it's the triceps, maybe it's the lats. So you make that the, the muscle group that's being prioritized and that's how you go about uh, adjusting your training. So again, your training has to constantly flow. It's got to constantly evolve. It's got to constantly, you know, reflect what it is that you're weak at. And by getting those weaknesses stronger, your lifts are going to go up. It's the same thing for sport performance. You got to look at the qualities that you're lacking and you've got to prioritize those qualities in training. You know, or you're not fast enough, or you're not explosive enough, or you're not strong enough. You've got to evaluate with the help of your coach and with your strength coach or your trainer. You've got to look at where you're breaking down and what needs to be developed. Uh, and it's not always just technique. You know, strength is important, power is important, speed's important. You've got to look at a lot of these other issues because uh, at the higher levels for most people their technique's pretty good and it doesn't it, I, I believe technique can be overemphasized quite a bit but anyway so you know when I go back to the idea of not being a big fan of programs if you just take a cookie cutter program it may not give you everything that you need to develop now the the younger you are in your training age if you're a beginner you're gonna respond to almost anything but the more experience you get under your belt, the more your body is adapting and accommodating to the training, to the list that you're doing, you have got to start changing your training based on what you need. So just following a cookie cutter program isn't going to work. And the issue that I see, you know, when I'm reading, you know, different people's posts on social media, I'm reading these different blogs and articles or seeing some comments and some discussion forums, everybody's looking for the next program. They're just program hopping. They're going to try this program for a little while, this program for a little while, this program for a little while. And the one thing is they never make any progress because they're not sticking to anything and, and really allowing for development. So you, like I said, you really need to just understand the methods of training and then how to apply that those methods into your own training program. So focus on principles and not programming and you'll experience a lot more success when it comes to your own personal development. So hopefully you enjoyed this uh, video. Hopefully it gave you some tips and ideas as far as programming or maybe some things to think about about your training, about where you can make some improvements. If you've got any questions or comments, be sure to leave them in the comments section below the video. If there's any topics that you'd like me to address in future videos, be sure to leave those in the comments section as well or hit me up directly. All my contact information is listed in the details under the video. And until next time, stay strong and stay healthy.